Did you know that kinky wellness is integral to your self-development? Hi, welcome to the partition home of kinky wellness, the ultimate destination to explore the integral connection between kinky wellness and your personal development. I'm your host and kinky wellness coach, Dana Shergill. And each Monday, I bring on a special guest to dive into specific aspects of kinky wellness. From unconventional practices to thought-provoking conversations, I'm here to break down barriers and redefine the boundaries of wellness and pleasure. Don't forget to join me for my solo shows on Wednesdays, where I explore even further into the multifaceted layers of kinky wellness. So let's strip away the shame and taboo together and have an open conversation about it. Hey, and welcome back. Today, we are joined by Shelby Avan. Shelby is a relationship and intimacy coach, as well as a Reiki healer who is here to give us a breakdown on the four different attachment styles and how they relate to our intimacy and relationships. So without skipping a beat, let's welcome Shelby to the show and learn a little bit more on the attachment styles. Well, hello, Shelby. How are you doing today? I am doing well. Thank you for asking. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for being here. And I'm excited because today we're going to be talking about attachment styles and what that means in relation to intimacy. Mm -hmm. So why don't we begin with just a little bit about you and kind of what you do and how you got into attachment styles and what brought you into that specifically? There's kind of a, a bigger backstory actually before I even got to the attachment styles, but there's a few different things. The intimacy side of things, I've always been interested in kind of like the cycle of life in general, whether it's reproduction, like on the sciencey side of things, human or animals, I've been interested in it. And then like sexuality in itself, I've been interested in for quite a while too. I used to actually work with uh, horses and I would, I was like an equine midwife. So I'd bring baby race horses into the world. And so I got to see a lot of the reproduction and the birthing side of things there, which I really, really liked. Being in the breeding shed was really interesting too. Um, I liked, I, I thought I just found all that stuff really, really interesting. So I had like a certain level of interest on like there where I focused my knowledge and aspects of it came from there coming into coaching. I actually started on a spiritual track first, which was, I learned Reiki first because I was actually, I was not feeling super great, uh, with some stuff that was going on in my life. And, um, a friend of mine asked if I wanted to try out Reiki and I said, sure, I don't really know what this is, but I'll give it a go. And then it was such a cool, like magical experience, to be honest. It was like something I've never, never experienced before that I wanted to learn how to do it as well. And then that helped me really get in tune with my energetic and intuitive gifts. And then from there, as I started using that um, healing gift on, on clients, I started to realize that I wasn't really like, I, I could help people find a certain understanding in themselves and find where like these emotional blockages were coming up in their bodies or these energetic things that were coming up, but it was kind of still illuminating a problem without giving them an answer, which I wanted to be able to give them an answer. And I, I didn't like that. I couldn't do that. And so eventually I found attachment styles through Oh, this is actually a good part of the story. Um, ironically, the coach, the way I found this was I was, I was doing a coaching program with a, with a pro well, she's not a pro dom anymore, but she's a dom and she told me about it. And I was like, oh, okay. So I'll go and learn more about this through like this attachment style stuff. And then that was kind of like all the answers that I needed to be able to help my clients from there. So all the emotional stuff that was coming up, how people needed to deal with that, what was causing those blockages in the first place. I now had the tools by learning about attachment styles and how to handle, like understand what your needs are, your boundaries, how to communicate well. I, I could tell people how to do that so that they didn't have to have those blockages stuck and living in their body anymore. Well, that's wonderful. What an interesting journey from horses to pro-dom to this, like that mm -hmm. is, and even Reiki, like that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So that is incredibly helpful. So what are the attachment styles then? Okay. So there are, there are four. So the first one is uh, secure. So this is like a very balanced um, attachment style, very good at communicating. They know how to express what their needs are. They know how to take care of themselves in a way they can both give and receive evenly. That's not really a problem for them. If there's an issue, they're going to talk about it. They're going to say something's bothering them. They're, nothing's really, everything's going to be pretty like, you know, exactly where this person's coming from and what they're about. There's not really any deception in there. 
Then there is the anxious attachment style, which is kind of exactly what it sounds like. It's this person that's, um, they have a core wounding, which is being really scared of being abandoned basically. And so that really kind of drives them. So they're very, they can be very, come across very needy, wanting a lot of connection and, and, and just like people pleasing all the time, being anxious that they won't, they're, they're not going to get the love that they want or their, their people are going to leave them. Then there's the dismissive avoidant who is their main core wound is, is usually, um, they feel like something's wrong with them. So like they're defective and they are better at being on their own because they've learned that they can't rely on other people. They will try to, and then they just don't get what they need. They don't get that love. They don't get, people don't follow through for them. Um, so they just rely on themselves. And so they're not very good at receiving. They can be okay with giving, but they're kind of very much like these lone, these lone wolves that will go and like not really allow themselves to get very connected with other humans. And then there's the fearful avoidant, which is also known as like the disorganized attachment style. And this one kind of fluctuates between the anxious and the avoidant um, styles. So they, their biggest wound is usually about betrayal and not being able to trust people. Like there's an inconsistency in their lives, which may mean like there was like dangerous situations when they were younger. It could be that their parents just went around super consistently. They might've been loving, but just not there all the time or other inconsistencies or, or feelings of like unsafety or people like kind of lying, lying to them, stuff like that. So that can be a thing there, but then their problem always seems to be like, it's a, this is what mine actually was, was the FA. Um, I want love and affection, but I'm kind of scared to get it. So you might see like that grabby energy. And then all of a sudden kind of be like, Ooh, ah, uh, ah, uh, I don't know about that. And it, and it goes back and forth. So it can be really confusing. Cause it's like, <laughs> I don't really know what you want. Um, and that can kind of be what the fearful avoidance struggles with and, and looks like. Well, thank you for outlining that. I definitely think that I am, or I would say that I was the ancient one, like very, mm -hmm. like think people are going to go away. And even with the dismissive one, it, it sounds like it's somebody who well, on the outside would look very independent, but almost mm -hmm. too independent to the point where it's hindering their development, which is people in relationships in general. Yeah. Cause it's, well, yeah. Cause it can be like, you know, if, um, a dismissive would be like my, my freedom is being hindered. Like there's something about you that's bothering my freedom and my alone time and stuff like that. Like there's, you know, so when we're creating this, obviously this always stems back to our childhood and how things are being raised. And so obviously it seems like secure attachment style comes from a family that, received a, like, you know, a balance. There's no such thing as a perfect parent, but a balanced mm -hmm. enough where someone is able to realize that they are an individual and they have something to give and they feel comfortable with intimacy and relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't, in all honesty, and like, I guess with the work that I do, I don't really necessarily see a lot of people that are naturally balanced. I think everyone kind of has some work to do in some aspect and people still lean one direction or another, but, but as I don't know, but at the same time, like as you do the work, you can find people that are a lot more balanced. So yeah, I, I don't know. That's kind of <laughs> what I've got to say about that. I'm just like, I don't know if I've actually seen anyone that's grown up in a super balanced place or not. So it's just one of those things like, again, like, yeah, because there's no perfect parent, you kind of walk out with one of these things, even if it's a small degree or a large yeah. degree. And yeah. so in some of like the worst case scenarios, or what would be some clear signs then of some of these? Well, okay. The one... <laughs> The one I, I joke about this one a little bit, but it's, it's kind of true. I can notice an anxious attachment very clearly, um, based off of how they interact with me, like how they text or email, uh, or message me in some way, which it's basically going to be a page. Like it's going to be a very long, significant amount of words that's going to be sent to me. That's usually the anxious one. Like they just, and they want to connect all the time. So there's like, there's one person I can think of in particular from my past who they would just like text me all day or send me voice notes all day long. And a lot of them, like there was, it was kind of like, there's no, <laughs> there's not a lot of uh, airtime in between. And then they get worried if you don't respond too. So it's like that emotional regulation side of things isn't really there for the anxious. With the avoidant, I, I'd say some of the signs you'd see would be like, they, they aren't able to receive very well. Mm. So they're not really able to receive being taken care of sometimes even 
compliments can be hard. Um, you might hear them say things like I'm, you know, like it's, it's, this is kind of relating to the receiving side of it, but it's like, like, I'm good. I've got it covered. I can do this, but you'll notice it a lot of the time and it's, and, and that they're yeah not really accepting things. And then the fearful avoidant, I find it's fearful avoidance are interesting because when you first meet them, they're they're They can be pretty good because they really want to connect and can really show up and be super, super present with you. And then it just, then it kind of goes back and forth a little bit later in the relationship and it can go anxious avoidant. It'll be this, this swinging. So it'll be like this hot and cold feeling. Their baseline is usually chaos. So if, if that seems to be what surrounds them, if they are a chaotic human, actually anger, they can be angry and irritated and like quicker to light. Cause usually they've got this resentment building up and then all of a sudden it's an explosion and a hard boundary that will come out from a fearful avoidant. Oh, that's very interesting. Mm-hmm. So it almost seems like it's delayed. Like you can't really tell when you first meet them. And then it kind of just reveals itself the longer that you know them. Yeah. But it's, it's because they're getting more and more scared. So as you trust, as they start to have more feelings, as they start to feel like they can or want to trust you more, then there's more involved and there's more to lose. And then that scares them. So they might be like, Oh, I don't know. I don't really know if I want to get hurt. So they might push you away. But at the same time, then they're like, but I, I don't really know how to deal with this. I actually do want you to. So how do I, so it's like this, I don't know. I just don't know how to, how to live <laughs> in between these two worlds. So you'll get a little bit of both. In a relationship context, that would be very frustrating, I think, for the yeah. other person on the receiving end. Yeah. And when it comes to actually the dismissive avoidant, it kind of sounds like they suppress or they minimize a lot of their themselves, like even with the other person, but they themselves are kind of like, oh it's okay. I don't, I don't really need this type thing. Like they kind of avoid that emotional closeness a little bit. Well, I think I I've noticed that avoidance are a lot more logical. They're very, yeah, very logical, kind of like a lot more structured emotions are kind of taken out of it, but I think that they've kind of just put their emotions off to the side. So that's, they can access it, but I think a lot of their emotional stuff hurts them. So they, they're just like, I'm just going to put this away in a box over here. We're just going to go like logical mind, think these things, do this. And and that's how it's going to be. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. So when you're looking at this from like a sexual relationship, say people are just going out and they just want to like have some fun and they're not really interested in per se a relationship, but how would each of these kind of break down when it comes to like a sexual encounter? So typically you're going to have it's always, it's very often going to be like anxious avoidant dynamics that you're going to have. One person be anxious, one person's going to be avoidant. And then if there's fearful avoidance involved, they can kind of lean one way or the other, depending on what the other person is. So if the, if they're with an anxious person, they're going to lean a little bit more avoidant kind of situation. So when it comes to sex and intimacy with an anxious person, they're likely going to be people pleasing. And so they could eventually get resentful because they're not actually getting their needs met. They're not really doing the things they want. Um, again, they, they might see sex as something more validating and like they, they are cared about, they are loved and that's how they'll, they'll use sex, which again, why they people please is so that ideally their person doesn't go away and they're like, Oh no, like I'll be everything that you need that you could ever want. And then I'll be validated and loved and cared for and you won't leave me. And, but then in in saying that too, then that's also not very good because there's kind of like this consent issue that comes with that. Because if the anxious person doesn't know the things that they enjoy, like need, want, or where their boundaries lie, then they could internally be again, getting very resentful or really upset because their things are happening that they actually don't want to happen or that they don't like, but they're not sharing it with their partner because they don't want their partner to leave them. Mm. And then that's hard on both sides. It's like partner is doing things that are like non-consensual, but they don't know because their partner hasn't expressed it or their partner doesn't even know that about themselves. So it's very, that's a very, very hard thing to deal with. And then with the, with the dismissive side, I find it's, it's, they, I find that they can dissociate is one of the things that they have a problem with. Sex might be more casual, transactional, kind of like that logical thing again, like I need to meet a need met. I want to feel pleasure. This is what's going to fill that need. Okay. Check the box. We're good. And then actually one of the other interesting things in this, which I've I've noticed this in poly dynamics a little bit is that sometimes if, if it's someone that's more dismissive, they might actually use poly in a way that they don't have to make deep connections because they'll just have too many partners. 
Mm. So it's just more surface level versus having those deep, really meaningful connections. So poly can be done in a healthy way and it can be done in, in ways that serve the attachment style. Um, so that's one of the things I've noticed with dismissives. And then with the fearful avoidant, again, because there's like trust issues there, sometimes that can show up where they do like the same things that are untrustworthy or like spiteful in in some of the their sexual encounters. So like they could withhold sex or cheat because someone hurt them. Mm. They might do do things like that on the like more negative side of things, or they'll um the other thing that I notice is that sometimes they'll use sex as a way of repairing a like a um, a conflict without actually having the conversation. Interesting. So it really feels like almost if you're going to go, well, really, regardless of what type of relationship you're in, whether it's just like with one person or multiple people, really knowing your attachment style is going to help you, but it's also going to help you understand why you go into certain relationships or why you use them in certain ways. Mm hmm. Yeah. Often you're getting into these relationships, which are very common to what you've experienced when you were younger. So like the anxious is always going to be looking for, for that person to be there to feel loved and validated. And they're going to seek that out. And, and, but the normal is that maybe they're not prioritized. They're not, they're being with people that aren't super present. They're distant. Like it's, it's just not accessible to them, but it's like, this is my normal. So this is what I'm naturally going to be attracted to, even though in my head, I know that I don't want that, but it's just, it's just like what our baseline is. It's just what ends up happening is until we start to recognize the, the things that we need to change. It's, we keep going with the same pattern that we've always, we've always done. Now, do you see like a particular attachment style that's more dominant than the other one in your practices or with among your clients, like one that stands out the most? Um, I would say that the people that are more likely to do the work are the anxious and the fearful avoidance. The avoidance have to feel pretty crappy to want to do the work and actually feel their feels. Okay. And what about the dismissive? Because because you noticed that, or you said that they were a bit on the intellectual side. And so I feel like there's a common theme going around that people are over and intellectualizing their feelings and things, but they're not actually feeling it. And do you feel that that's what's going on with the dismissive one as well? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like, uh, yes. With the dismissive avoidant, there can be, like I was saying in regarding like sex too, there can be that disassociation that happens, like literally leaving the body. Right. And, um, be because it's easier because they don't want to feel their feelings, but a lot, I think with any, with any of the attachment styles that really can happen, it's like, we're not used to feeling, um, to sitting with our feelings. And so then we try to cope with a certain way, a certain thing, which mm -hmm. can be like with other people with a certain type of, um, like dismissive avoidance are more likely to do have some like creature comforts. Like they might be really into video games or like a TV series or other type of technology type stuff. It seems to be more so, but yeah, they can have like this thing that they just really dive into. And there's this different world where they connect in a way that feels safe to them. And I think that's good to notice that it's not necessarily that some people are trying to like avoid it's like they are avoiding it, but it's just because it's mm -hmm. painful and yeah. what can look like, oh, like they're just obsessed with their funny TV show. Like it might actually be a distraction and it kind of sounds like it might be almost like a, a smoke screen to what's mm -hmm. really going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Until they, again, they actually recognize what's kind of going on. Um, and that what they're doing isn't serving them. It's that's exactly what it's going to be. It's so do you, sorry, mm -hmm. that's all. That's okay. Go ahead. So do you have any like questions that you could get somebody to ask themselves, like some self-reflection questions as how someone could identify which one they are? Hmm. Questions in themselves. So um, I think, okay. One of them would be like when conflict comes up, how do you often move go through that? Like, is it, if you're upset, you naturally immediately go and try to find comfort in another human. Hmm. Do that would be an anxious. Do you immediately go into a hidey hole, push everyone away and don't come out for a while. That would be an avoidant. Fearful avoidant. I feel like is creating chaos, <laughs> creating more chaos. <laughs> um, <laughs> The chaos aspect of that, that's interesting. So it's like somebody who came out of like, I guess, 
chaos in their childhood just kind of follows that through and because they're used to it. Yeah. 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 Oh, so these are, oh, this is actually also a really good example of it. So, um, fearful avoidance might be people that like to travel consistently. Like they don't want to put roots down anywhere. They want to be bouncing around. And that's again, like that chaotic energy. Ah, interesting. Mm -hmm. And actually, jobs. It, it can go with jobs too. So they just really can't like secure things like long-term commitments is not something that they mm -hmm. are used to. Yeah. Yeah. So we have one attachment style that doesn't really like long-term commitments or they're fearful of it. And then we have a couple others where that's all they're looking for. It's just like that ultimate, you're never going to leave me situation. Yeah. And so what type of ones tend to like pair up together? Like the anxious and the fearful tend to go together first? Um, I would say anxious and avoidant, but again, the fearful avoidant are kind of like a chameleon. They can go either way. They can kind of match up with either either side because they sw they can swing more to one side depending on who they're with so again if they're with an anxious person then they'll start to lead lean more avoidant and then if they're with an avoidant person they'll lean more anxious so what are some ways that somebody might be able to help themselves kind of move towards more of the secure attachment style i think one of the biggest things is uh no there's two understanding what your needs are would be first in combination with understanding how to emotionally regulate your body and your nervous system. So those two things are probably some of the biggest ones. So understanding what your needs are looks like, you know, I know I want emotional connection and how can I get this in a way that's healthy? How can I give it to myself and how can I get it met by others? So it's always kind of asking both and seeing if one is more full than the other, because the anxious is going to be like, oh, I'm great. I can just go to others. I'm like, no, no, no. Where's, how do you meet it for yourself too? Mm -hmm. You need to, you need to know how to do that more. And this needs to become more equal. And then the avoidant will be like, oh, well, I'm great at meeting that for myself. Like, okay. And with others. <laughs> and then, so it's just kind of switching there. And then the fearful avoidant is going to be somewhere in between. So yeah, starting to understand what your needs are, why, and even like why that they might be your need in general. Like, okay, I do recognize that, um, you know, like safety is really important to me. So what does that look like for me? Okay. I need to know that my, you know, I have a house that I'm not going to get kicked out of. I know it's mine. I know how I have a steady income that can pay for my house. I know I can pay for my groceries. Like safety is literally like that, those very core basic things, right? I know I feel safe in my home. I have I feel safe where I'm going to work and in the places that I'm going to be, like, I feel good. And then how do you feel safe in your body? Because usually we just don't feel safe in our body either because we're dysregulated. And that's where that other piece comes in, understanding the need and then understanding how to regulate ourselves so that we can um, like come home to ourselves basically. So when it comes to regulating ourselves, do you have any pointers or tips on how someone can do that? I know that I've mentioned on the podcast previously, a lot of times like deep breathing and breath work and things like that and meditation and journaling and things like that. But do you have any additional tips that might help somebody? Yeah, well, there's, so it depends on where you're at and where you're like, what your dysregulation is. Cause if you are in, like there's a different levels of um, fight or flight mode or um, sorry, like regulated versus dysregulated. So fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. So if you're in like a flight or a fight mode, then your body is going to have a lot of energy inside of it. So, so to say like, just sit there and breathe, not going to work. Mm. <laughs> That's not going to work for them. They need to go and they need to actually move their body. So that might be something that they, they might actually naturally do this. Um, Cause I recognize recent or made the full acknowledgement that I start, started doing this naturally on my own. When I went into those um, dysregulated states, I would just start walking. I'd be like, I gotta go for a walk. I can't stay in here. I try to do yoga and be like, nope, too slow for me. Let's go do something else. Or I'd like dance really hard, something I'd have to, I'd really have to move it out of my body. So it's kind of like recognizing there's, there are a few different types of tools. So yes, the, you know, journaling, meditating, breathing can work. I find breath work is interesting because it can be very it can help you get more present, but depending on whether you can actually sit still with it, um, is something you have to take into, into consideration. So those are some of the quieter ones. Sometimes you have to do something more active and it's just like noticing what your body is really feeling is like, what is it that I need? And making sure that you're doing something productive, like don't punch a wall kind of thing. Like, you know, <laughs> do, um, do some other type of activity, like sometimes something really intense, like a fast sprint or something like push-ups might be what you need to do and just do them really fast, really hard until you 
fall down and start crying. Like there's going to be an emotional release that happens with something like that too. If like there's a very intense feeling in, happening in your body, usually there's an emotional release too. So, and that can be, that can be part of the regulating thing. If you can actually get yourself to cry or scream or even it can be laugh, like you can feel really uncomfortable and then just be like, I'm not supposed to be laughing right now. This is like the laughing at a funeral thing. Like just <laughs> let it out because it needs to be expressed and needs to be released in some way. So just try to do that. And I think even I wouldn't, I wouldn't like suggest this always, but sometimes there's this, like, I know I need to cry and I don't know how to access that right now. So it might be like, okay, I know this movie is really sad and that movie has made me cry before and utilizing it as a tool and, you know, like actively recognizing it can be a tool to help you get there and have that emotional release. Absolutely. Cathartic experiences all the way, like when it comes to that. And you know what? We do need help. Like I, I've said this before, like even when it comes to releasing emotional things, sometimes it has to start out physically. Like when I bring it back to like BDSM and kink mm -hmm. and you can get that ball rolling and it's okay to ask or use other resources to get that going. And then once you get mm -hmm. the tears going, then, <laughs> then it tends not to stop. You're just like, you get it out and it's good. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I didn't even touch on that part, but I agree. Like if you are in the situation that is <laughs> healthy, sane, safe, consensual, then yes, utilize the kink BDSM way of like using whatever types of tools, whether it's psychological or physical type of tools to help get that release out of your body. That's fine. Just sometimes depending where you are on your healing journey, you'll still get into dynamics that aren't actually good and they're manipulative. And I can, I see them a lot more in the kink life's like BDSM style with like Dom. Yeah. The Dom, I don't, mm, yeah. Be careful with that one. It's, it can be very wonderful and you really have to know how to pick your partners first with that. And I agree with you even that, because if you are someone who has a taint, an anxious attachment style, then you aren't aware of it. You'll end up just constantly going after people that are undeserving and you're like self-questioning. It sounds like of kind of reaching for that person. And you can wind up in a really like manipulative and abusive mm -hmm. relationships if you're unaware of kind of what type of style you have. Yeah. Well, and people get it in their head that like being a dom, it looks a certain way. Right. And it's really, <laughs> it's really, really not the way that people think it is. So like I, I was actually at a munch the other day and I got really irritated by this, this human <laughs> that was there and he introduced himself as a dom and the way that he was just the things that he was saying, I was like, you are here sub hunting and I feel like you think you're going to get it at this table. And let me tell you, no way is it going to be happening here. Like I, I ignored him pretty quickly. Some of my friends were there too. And that I asked, I asked her afterwards, like, what do you think of that guy? And she's like, oh yeah, no, <laughs> not good. Cause it was, it was so, it was so obvious to the both of us, but if you are an anxious person looking for that need to be met, you know, that you like kink, you know, you have a certain thing that you like, you know, you like to be subby, you like how that can come out, um, in those, in like those kink dynamics, it can, it's strong. It's pretty strong. So if you want to, if you see that there's an opportunity for that to be met, someone can see that and utilize that against you. <laughs> yeah. When it comes to doms pretending that they're doms and it just turns out that just control yeah. people, like it can take somebody with an attachment style that ancient, like anxious by surprise though, because they're kind of mm -hmm. like, wait what happened here? But in the same breath, it's like, there are people that walk into BDSM and kink that aren't ethical. Like they're not really looking mm -hmm. out for your well being; They just looking out for them. And that's something that we do need to acknowledge. I think within the, we do. Yeah, we do acknowledge this, but sometimes when you're first getting into BDSM and kink, some people might think, Oh, like everyone's friendly. Everyone's this, everyone's that. Cause we do have a lot of conversations around consent and Mm -hmm. But just because you have a conversation with consent doesn't mean that they're going to try to manipulate you later down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, and I always felt like, I don't think like that life is the best place to be for, for finding things, but I always felt when I was on there that it wasn't, um, like everyone that reached out to me, there was only like maybe three people I felt that reached out to me ever who didn't have other intentions in mind than, than what they set out with originally. Yeah. Like I, I just, I just always felt it. 
Yeah, when it comes to fet life, it's so interesting because like you can go there with a lot of knowledge and there's a lot of resources there, but in the same breath on a general consensus, if you look at it just as an individual, there's a lot of harassment, there's a lot mm -hmm. of just random messages and you can set up your account to block those, but it's something to take notice of that if you are going to go on fet life, that's just part of the website as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But back to <laughs> attachment styles. No, that was very interesting. Um, like when we start this now, are there steps where someone can catch themselves and be like, oh, I don't want to be dismissive anymore. And how would they be able to like kind of regain not being dismissive? Is it just like a accountability and self-awareness that they would need to work on? Yeah. Yeah, basically, because it's it's kind of like recognizing, oh, I'm, I'm starting to pull away now. So some of that just looks like, you know, communicating, you know, I don't know how to not pull away right now. So I'm going to pull away, but I'll, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to need, like, I'm going to need two hours or whatever the time frame is. And then I'm going to get back to you. And so starting to communicate that timeline so that the anxious person's like, okay, they've given me a timeline. I should hear back from them by then. I am going to their, their part of it will be like, I'm not going They like, they need that space. I'm not going to message them. I'm going to find a way to meet my needs up and like until then some other way, or maybe I will want to message them, but I'm going to put all my messages over here on this side, not at, like, you know, in, in a note instead of actually sending it in a text. Right. So like kind of just trying to redirect some of the things instead, or again, trying to regulate self trying to regulate self first is ideal, but like there's certain step stepping stones that people need to take. Sometimes you just can't do that. You're like, ah, I need to send, I need to send the messages. Like, okay, write it over here. Don't send it to them yet. Wait till that time frame. like help build that trust that you will, if they say they need two hours, you will not message them for those two hours. Help them trust that you're, you're good to your word as well. And respect too. Like these are mm -hmm. comes down to boundaries and things like that, like being able to, but that can be hard when mm -hmm. one side of you is like, I want to respect the two hour limit. And then the other side, especially if you're anxious is like, <gasps> but what are they doing? Like, why does that make me feel this way? And people yeah. really don't like sitting in that discomfort. And so I feel like for most of us, we're unaware that some of the actions that we're doing, even if they're not intentionally bad, they're hurting our relationships and they're hurting our ability to maintain that intimacy and to grow deeper into that relationship. Yeah. Well, and I think like, you know, as you're, as you're giving the example of the anxious thought patterns there too, it's like what's happening, what's going on. Usually <laughs> there's no good stories that go along with, with that thought pattern. It's never like, what could be going right, right now. <laughs> but so even if, if people could start to think that instead of be like, you know, it could be this story or maybe it's this. And it's something more positive or it's like, or these, it's these other options. Same thing with like, I don't know, like timelines, right? So, you know, they said they get back to me by this point in time, maybe not in the same situation here, but something else. Like they said, they text me back later today. I haven't heard from them. Like, okay, well, what could be keeping them? You know, like, are they driving? Do they not have Bluetooth? So they're trying to actually be safe so they can get home to you. Could they have like met a friend and be caught up with them right now? Like, you know, what else could be happening right now that could not be that, oh my God, they're cheating on me and they're going to leave me and they're never coming back home ever again. It kind of sounds for somebody with that, it, you need a hobby or not a, like a, like a <laughs> goal or something or a focus where if your person is not with you during that moment that you're not mm -hmm. sitting around waiting for them or waiting for that phone call, waiting for that text message, waiting for whatever the case may be. And because uh, waiting is painful, like for anything, yeah. regardless of like just in general, waiting sucks sometimes. So yeah. that could be an idea that somebody might be able to do to help themselves in that. Yeah, for sure. And again, that goes along with understanding what your needs are, because if you start to understand what your needs are, then you can have them fulfilled. Like I know that one of mine, for example, again, it's, it's emotional connection and then self-expression, sexuality, those things are all like needs that I have. And one way that I get a lot of that met is by going to my dance classes. I can express myself there. It's like, it's very sacral energy. So uh, this is like Reiki term. So sacral being creativity, sexuality, and emotions um, all coming out in, in dance, which meets a lot of my needs. So I go and do that a couple times a week, if not more, depending on what my 
you know, schedule looks like and stuff. And I get that need met and that keeps me busy. I make new friends. Yeah. And I think it's important to note that like you can't expect one person to meet every single need. Mm -hmm. Like it's not something that you can do. So like you do have to fulfill those needs by yourself as well. And like what you said, like figuring that out is a big one. But when it comes to these attachment styles, like, are there key points that you just really want people to know about each of these? There's one big main one, which is that you can change it. It's, it's a journey to do it. It's going to take some time, but if you want to do it, and especially if you want to do it quickly, like hire me (laughs) (laughs) and then we can get like a good role uh, rolling within 12, 12 weeks, very quickly. It's something like you'll be a lot more secure within 12 weeks, but yeah, you can change it. You can change it. It's it's very possible to become more secure. It's possible to be able to learn the skills. The same with like, you know, kink and sex skills. You have to, you just have to apply yourself and start to learn and, and then you'll get better. So if somebody wanted to reach out to you and do that, what would they expect from your 12 week in order to be more secure? Um, so the, like the, what the program looks like kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Okay. So basically it starts with, it starts with understanding like the needs, like I've been saying here each there's every two weeks, we kind of like switch up the theme of what it looks like. So it's usually like needs. Um, then we'll start talking about boundaries. We'll talk, start talking about, um, some core wounding. So there's, there's a lot of different core wounds and they can kind of all jumble in together, depending if something happens. Um, it can be like a domino effect of all these core wounds getting coming up all at once and stories that come up in your head. And so, yeah, like some of the tools that we've used a little bit here today, like, you know, how can we question those stories and how do we regulate ourselves and understanding what it is that our body is saying to us. And then, um, if people are interested, I'll include like Reiki and the, and, um, in the programs as well, we can do a Reiki session. And then usually it's, well, no, not usually pretty much always it's building all that relational skill level first and then closer to the end of the program then we get to into the, like the sexuality side of things so it's like okay so now we understand what our needs look like what our boundaries are now how do we express like what it is that we want in bed how do we find our our boundaries like what does consent look like to us how does that feel in our body so it's we're building that that basic structure there and then we're applying it into sexuality afterwards if people want to go that route like they don't we don't have to touch sexuality i really like to but we that's kind of the trajectory of what it looks like. Well, obviously I'm biased. And I think that if someone were to take your course, they should definitely include that <laughs> because sexual, our sex life is so important to us. And I know it that is. we've touched on a few core wounds for each of them, but are there off, like, are there overlooked core wounds that would fall into these categories that people might think, oh, I didn't realize that. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot, there's like I think there's like 15 that I know of different types of wounds. Those are kind of just the main ones that I touched on, but there are things like feeling like, again, feeling unsafe can be a pretty big one. Um, Not feeling seen or heard, not feeling understood, not feeling worthy, feeling unlovable, abandoned, defective. I've said bad, bad's actually bad is a pretty kinky one. (laughs) That's a pretty fun one to play with in the kink world. But yeah, people can literally just think that they're like bad humans and it's not true, but they can like, even, you know, even if you just think of a lot of like when you're growing up and people just being like, no, that's bad. Don't do that Mm. to a young child. It's kind of like, oh, you might internalize that and be like, oh, I'm bad because I did that bad thing. And it's one of those things like our language matters with children and they Mm -hmm. might not catch the nuances that you're trying to say and they just hear it point mm-hmm. blank. So yeah, if you say you're bad or, you know, can't you be more like this or X, Y, Z, that really is going to mold how that person is going to grow up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add on this? Um, well, I could talk about my program. So I have two actually. So I've got my group coaching program, which that's going to start. Uh, it's the first Sunday of April. I think it's the seventh or eighth is when my next group coaching is going to start. So it's a small container. It's a maximum 10 people in that 12 week program that I'll be doing. And then I also always do my one-on-one program. So um, it's empowered intimacy is my one-on-one and then intimacy incubator for the group program. So I've got both of those available and, and upcoming. And then if you guys are interested too, I also have a freebie, which is my um, intimacy. Yes, no, maybe list. So there's emotional intimacy and then there's physical intimacy on that list. So you can just 
go on my website and uh, basically sign up for my subscription. It's down a little, scroll down a little bit on the page and you can sign up for it there. Yeah. And I may, I may have, I'm not sure by the time this comes out, but I may have my um, private podcast that will come out soon, which is like three, uh, a three part podcast. I think it's gonna be more on attachment styles and intimacy, but it's not made yet. So I can't promise exactly what it's going to look like. (laughs) Well, I'll add all your links in the description so people can find you, but where's your Instagram handle? What would your website? Oh, well, my Instagram handle is intimacy mistress (laughs) and uh, my website is shelbyavan.ca. Wonderful. Two two ends. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show and giving us more clarity on attachment styles and intimacy. And for my listeners, I will see you on Wednesday. You guys know what to do. Stay kinky. Bye guys.